was doing plenty of psychology. Come into me, just you know, the back of my head saying, you know, just get rid of this stupid religion. You wrecked it off and it off. Because he or she has been programmed in some way about religiosity. You know, no, we're all six is wrong. All right, how many people came to the house and that? Jesus says it's wrong. Well, you know, I can't prove Jesus said anything. So I can't get them out of that mindset sometimes. But that's the kind of mindset parent, Christian parents have. So if you've got the mindset, how are you going to talk to your kids? you got a problem with that. Because we know, a uh, survey research going back to the 1950s shows that 95% of all people have premarital sex. Now, they may have premarital sex with the person they end up married, but it's still wrong, according to Jesus, not according to Daryl. So, 95%. So what that tells me is that 95% of uh, Americans are having premarital sex, and the other 5% are Baptist ministers and Catholic priests. <laughs> well, and the fact is, if you're married and have kids, you probably had premarital sex. When your kid comes up and says, Dad, did you have premarital sex? Well, if I'm a good Christian, I'm going to lie. Yeah. 
down here, 2.2% on our sample setting out worse. We were really interested in those 2.2%. We gave, uh, for those of you who took the survey, you can remember we gave lots of opportunities for people to make comments. We got over 4,000 comments. Some of these comments are pages long. It's like people wanted to give us their life story and tell us all about stuff I've never heard of before. I mean, there are kinks and fetishes. They told us that. Well, I won't go into that. 29% of respondents have a kink or a fetish. I learned new words. But I knew a lot about it. I understood. Amanda's actually kind of an expert on fetishes and kinks, and she learned new stuff, too. So this too, so we went in and we looked at the comments of the 2.2% that said it got worse. We wanted to know, okay, what makes it worse when you become an atheist? And we got to know why. Some of these letters were hilarious. One guy said, well, when I was a Christian, I could lay every girl in the Sunday school class. <laughs> now they won't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Another man, I told my wife I'm an atheist and she won't sleep with me. She said I can't, I can't sleep with somebody that doesn't share my faith. Now, granted, seventy percent of our population is male, thirty percent female. That's another criticism of our research. Heck, that's the, that seems to be the cut in the atheist studies. We're seventy thirty. So that part is actually representative of the population. So it's not a good criticism of us. We're really sad. But um, we read through these hundreds and hundreds of comments and found that there's the very few times people said it got worse. It was related to access. People said, I can't find, a lot of guys said, I can't find an atheist girlfriend or an agnostic girlfriend. They just don't exist. Or the minute I tell a girl that I'm an atheist, she won't date me anymore. It's just, it's just that simple. So now we're going to look at denominations. Remember we had guilt by denomination? Now we can look at those group by denomination. What happened when you left your denomination? Who has the best improvement in its sex life? Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> <laughs> you are a Jehovah's Witness right now. You're at Norgies every night. It's 8.4. That's pretty high in uh, sexual satisfaction. Of course, they're starting to improve. <laughs> you know, just being able to have sex is probably a nine or a seven. But, um, Mennonites, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, Pentecostals, all of those are in the top five. I'm a little bit suspicious of the Mennonite number because it's barely enough. We, they didn't have 20 people in our sample, uh, former Mennonites or former anything. We wouldn't, but they barely made it. And you know, with small sample sizes, you get wide variation. I'm a little bit concerned about that. I'm not concerned about Jehovah's Witnesses. We had a couple hundred of those. Or the, or the Mormons, we had several hundred of those. Seventh-day Adventists, and all those, we had plenty of those in our sample. So I think it's fascinating that we can see how people's sex life improves. And again, we can go right back to the guilt cycle to see the more a religion uses guilt, more satisfied with sex they are when they leave it. They get rid of that burden. It's like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are carrying the biggest sexual burden on their back. And when they get out of Jehovah's Witness, you know, it's the most relief from that sexual burden. One of my ideas that we carry on some of the training we got when we were kids. How much longer do this, longer do that. And we bring that on into our, into our lives and then so we asked some questions about stuff that we know people are raised as being quote, wrong, especially things like pornography. So we asked people about their sexual entertainment. You know, what do you do for sexual entertainment? And here's what we came up with. We split them down by male and female. So among women, 45, 49% said they like erotic novels. Three percent said they like DVDs, films, with a plot. Does that mean it's got to be more than five minutes? <laughs> and uh, 
percent of women said they like pictures or photographs, and uh, 35 percent said they like internet shorts. 24 percent of women said they do not like pornography. These are secular women, atheist women. So about a quarter of our sample does not like pornography at all. But that's 75 percent who actively use some form of pornography. Now, it's, so therefore, because as we see here, men don't have this pattern. This is a female pattern. So, the male pattern. So, those are the male patterns are 71%. You can see it's all up the chart here. Internet shorts. Five minutes. That's about how long it takes a guy to do it. Yes. Because let's be frank, pornography is generally around masturbation. That's what it is. Nobody talks about that unless you use pornography. How is that possible? Well, what do you mean by use pornography? I'm masturbating to it. I'm, quote, using it. But nobody wants to say that out loud. That's like a taboo in our culture. Pictures, men like pictures. 69. We're incredibly visual creatures, of course. Yeah, males are. It takes a different set of stimuli to trigger in females. I uh, recommend another book to you. I recommended a billion wicked thoughts. Well, the next book is the best sex book I've ever read in my life. Arna, who I've read a lot. This just came out last year. It's called Sex at Dawn by Ryan and Jenna. And I have actually corresponded with Dr. Ryan a number of times. We love his book. I've endorsed his book. Um, they really explain well the differences of male female triggering mechanisms and look a lot of cultural stuff.
serious about it. It's really tough. I know this really tough. Because this is so common among the highly religious. There was a large space of time between becoming sexually active and becoming non-religious. During that time, I put myself at unnecessary risk of disease and pregnancy. While I was religious, guilt kept me from taking basic precautions like birth control or condom use. To me, using any sort of contraceptive was tantamount to admitting that I was planning for and indeed desirous of sexual activities. Deciding not to use contraception allowed me to convince myself that my pleasure is a side effect of fulfilling my boyfriend's desire for sexual activity. So the religion here was putting her in grave danger. She even knew it in some part of her mind, but she wasn't going to admit that she would say as Jesus told her not to do. We got these kinds of messages all over the place. This is what the absence only research has shown. The pure thing you've learned in this research and all the other research I've cited is biology happens. You cannot stop kids from having sex. They're going to do it. So let's educate them. Let's be, let's be open and honest with our kids, with our grandkids, with our nieces, nephews, whatever. And let's help them negotiate the world more rationally than what we were raised. So in our sample, there's evidence of the following. That the best thing you can do for your sex life is to get out of religion. Don't marry a religious person. We found an inverse relationship. We asked, one of the questions we asked was, on a scale of 1 to 10, how religious is your spouse? And the more religious the spouse was, the less satisfied the respondent was with their sex life. It's almost a one to one relationship. Spouse's religiosity, uh, we saw 76% impact on sexual satisfaction based on religiosity. So sexual guilt does little to change behavior, can cause you to express that drive or desire in inappropriate times and places. And biology happens. Now what I'm saying by that, first thing is, Part of our, my thesis is why the Catholic Church has so much trouble with pedophile priests problems. It's because they're pushing priests into an untenable human sexual position. When you do that, you create a monster. And it's not a monster even of their own making. Because many of these priests commit to the priesthood at a time that their own bodies are not developed yet. 12, 13, 14. I've talked to many priests. And they said, yeah, I was ready to be a priest when I was 12. When I became an altar boy, I just knew I wanted to be a priest, too. Well, who the hell knows what your sexual orientation is at 12 years old? Or even 14 or 21? You've got a lot of growing to do. And we're seeing people going into professions that are that are going to strip their sexuality. Very serious one. So I'm going to wind up by saying, I think religion is abundance. Sex is the weak spot of religion. And as atheists, one of my new goals is I want to start challenging religion at its root. There's not a single religion that's comfortable with sex. Except Unitarian. <laughs> so if we start challenging them about those very basic things, for example, we've got some interesting questions. How do you talk publicly about this stuff? Well, One of the questions I find interesting is if zygotes have, when do zygotes get their soul? Christians all say that no, a, a, a new, a, a conceived, conceived egg has got a soul. So, well, when is conceived? When do zygotes get the soul? And what about all the zygotes that are spontaneous? Like, when do they get souls? What about the ones that are in frozen some places? You know, and, uh, to wind it up, to say that sex is fun and so is drinking. And you should do them both responsibly. You don't have to have Jesus to tell you this. It's pretty common sense. It's pretty rational. Uh, and as rationalists, we have the power to take responsibility for our bodies, our lives, our pleasure, and responsibility for potential pain and harm that we can do to other people. So we need to be very aware how that works. Religious or not, they're unaware because they're denying their drive in the first place. Uh, we have knowledge.
realize your ability to make things, make good decisions, and and be and be a more reward for those activities that are business. But ultimately, we're responsible for our actions. We cannot pray to Jesus if we hurt somebody. We can't pray to Jesus to get rid of chlamydia or, or gonorrhea or anything like that. We have to say it's our job to to take care of our, ourselves and our partners. So if you want to go online and download it, go to ipcpress.com and you can get a survey. This is uh, my new book, as, as uh, our lady mentioned. This is the manuscript. Do not steal it. <laughs> <laughs> she is bad. Uh, recommended reading I gave you earlier. Uh, this is not in order of importance, but all good. First is the uh, myth of monogamy. One of the best books on sex and sexuality. Brash uh, of the did an amazing service, blowing away this whole idea that, that any, almost no species on the planet are monogamous. Certainly not humans. We're, we're very non monogamous. Now, we may not be as, as, as promiscuous as bonobos or chimps, but we're not too far behind. The sex and talk are right in chapter I mentioned earlier. Don't have the one I mentioned before up here, the, a billion wicked thoughts. The ethical slut uh, is it's about uh, 12 years old, still the best, I think the best, how to talk about, negotiate, and understand some interpersonal sexual relationships and emotions. It's an awesome book. It's written by two lesbian women who've been married for about 30 years. Well, I think they only got really married. They 